Awkward? Oh. <laughs> okay, first four questions we need to deal with. What happens during photosynthesis? Just like when we talked about cellular respiration, we need to talk about the overall process of photosynthesis. And just like when we were talking about cellular respiration, I will give you an equation that never happens. I will give you an equation for reaction that never happens, but it's a summation. It's a summary of several different processes, just like in cellular respiration, right? Right? Yeah. The reaction of C6H12O6 and oxygen becoming carbon dioxide and water, that reaction doesn't happen in your cells. That reaction happens when you light sugar on fire, right? It doesn't happen inside your cells, but it is a summary of what's happening during glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. And hopefully by this point, you've started to put the enzymes and all of the things involved in the steps of glycolysis onto index cards, and you are practicing putting them in order. It's going to be a helpful, helpful thing to be able to do, you know, just putting that out there for a hypothetical exam happening in a little bit over two weeks. All right. How is water used during photosynthesis? I'm glad you asked. We're going to talk about that because after the first question, you'll know the overall process and you're going to wonder, what, what does water do? And we'll talk about that. Uh, where does photosynthesis take place? And this isn't like in plants, right? Uh, or in, you know, autotrophic, photoautotrophic organisms, because that's obvious, but where in plants does it take place? Uh, and then the last one, how does the entire plant function in photosynthesis? Because we'll talk about specifically where it happens, but really everything in the plant is involved in it, just like in cellular respiration, right? Individual cells go through cellular respiration, and specific places in the cell are involved in the different parts of it, but your whole body's involved in cellular respiration, right? You need oxygen if you're going to go through aerobic respiration and you, you breathe in oxygen. I don't know if you knew that or not, but that's why you breathe in is so that you can take an oxygen and it can exchange with the carbon dioxide in your blood and oxygenate your blood. You all knew that. Wow. You all okay? I know it's Monday and it's the first Monday back. It feels a little heavy in here. Like I made a joke about drowning in a kayak or something. <laughs> All right. First question. What happens during photosynthesis? What happens during photosynthesis? The very next point on this slide is going to be a summary of the overall process. This reaction does not take place inside of photosynthetic organisms. So this is a summary of the process. Taking six molecules of carbon dioxide and 12 molecules of water to generate one molecule of glucose six molecules of oxygen, and six molecules of water. And so notice we've got six on this side, 12 on this side. So we, I mean, why do that? Let's just, you know, eliminate these six and cut this down to six. And then it's basically the exact reverse of the reaction we use as the summary of cellular respiration, right? Cellular respiration is one molecule of glucose, six molecules of oxygen as reactants, yes? Yes, produces six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water as products. And look at this, photosynthesis, if you, it, you, know, if you narrow this down or, or you simplify it, it's the exact opposite of that process. But again, neither one of those reactions actually take place. They are summaries of processes. So, also during photosynthesis, carbon is reduced. During cellular respiration, carbon is oxidized. During photosynthesis, carbon is reduced. Because when we oxidized carbon, we took it from carbon and sugar and oxidized all of it into what? When we oxidized the carbon from sugar, what did it become? Carbon dioxide, right? When we oxidize, I know it's been a while, but. <laughs> That, that needs to change. <laughs> I mean, not, not what happens. That, that can change. That's actually what takes place inside your cells. But your ability to just very quickly say that when you oxidize carbons and sugar, they, they get oxidized into carbon dioxide. This, this is what happens. So when we reduce it, we basically do the opposite. We take carbon as carbon dioxide, and we reduce it into carbon and sugar molecules. 
Because carbon and carbon dioxide, yes, technically it has eight valence electrons, but it's spending very little time with those electrons it's sharing with oxygen. Oxygen is an electron hog, okay? But when we get carbon in a sugar molecule, now it's spending a lot more time with those eight valence electrons it has. It's further reduced, okay? It's further reduced. Uh, so carbon has to get electrons and it also has to get hydrogen, hydrogen ions. So we need a source of electrons, we need a source of hydrogen ions. And so this is kind of what happens. We take carbon dioxide, some hydrogen ions, and some electrons, and, and we build sugars, which this right here is the general formula for a carbohydrate. Carb CH2O. And then this N is telling us that we've got multiple units of these, right? Glucose, we have six units of CH2O. Ribose, we've got five units of CH2O because it's a five carbon sugar, right? But you, you remember that from when we were talking about ribose and deoxyribose, right? You know, I know, Dr. Ingo, you know, that was on exam one. I don't think about that anymore. That's got to change too. <laughs> All right. So overall, in... Um, in photosynthesis, we basically have two different processes. We've got the light-dependent reactions. And in here, uh, we, we take electrons from our electron source. We put them onto an electron carrier, which it's not NAD plus in photosynthesis. It's NADP plus. The P stands for plants. That's not true. The P does not stand for plants, but that's how I remember it, right? Plants start with a P, and they look, there's a P there. Otherwise, it's just NAD plus. P doesn't really stand for plants in this, but it, it helps me remember. Uh, and then during the light-dependent reactions, we also generate ATP. Now, what does light-dependent mean? You need light. You need light. And so light is fueling these processes, and you're like, that's so cool. The only process light fuels in me is sunburns. Oh, and vitamin D production, of course. But, you know, it's not fueling making ATP. Now, this is cool, but we're not, photo, we're not photo autotrophs, but we eat them. Some of them are delicious. Some of them we eat because we have to. And then we've got the light independent reactions. And these take the electrons that are on this carrier and take the ATP we made during the light dependent processes, and they use that to reduce carbon, to reduce carbon or fix carbon uh, into a, a complex organic molecule, like glucose. Or really like G3P, because then glucose comes later, but that's, that's for later. Yeah, Chris. So is the NADP, um, is that the equivalent of NADH? Yes, okay. yeah, except for it becomes NADPH. When you attach some electrons onto it, it also takes a, it also takes a hydrogen. So it becomes a source of hydrogen and a source of two electrons. Yeah, yeah. It is the uh, molecular equivalent. Although plants also have NAD+. Plus because plants still go through cellular respiration, right? Which makes sense. Most of the sugar that plants make, they eat for themselves. But then what they don't, I eat. I mean, you can have some too, I suppose. There's a lot of plants. I mean, really, you can have all the plants. I just want what eats the plants. Um. Not, I'm, not humans, because... <laughs> Wow, my jokes are not getting any better today. <laughs> so here's a, uh, a nice figure uh, to just show that basically what we're doing in this process is we're taking carbon dioxide, we're reducing it, adding electrons to generate this complex organic molecule. But in the process, we need ATP, we need some kind of electron carrier to give those electrons to our carbon. And those two things, the electrons and the AD, AD, ATP are synthesized during our light dependent reactions and they're fueled by sunlight. Okay, the energy in sunlight is trapped, harnessed, and used to make ATP and to uh, strip electrons away from our electron donor. And if you look at this diagram, this is something we haven't talked about yet, but it's, it's the next, next question. What's our electron donor? Water. Look at this, water comes in, boom, leaves as O2. In cellular respiration, O2 came in, acted as a final electron acceptor and became water, right? And now it's the opposite's happening. It's starting as water, going through that way, becoming O2, donating its electrons to NAD plus, 
making it NADPH so that it can give those electrons to carbon and reduce carbon. Look at that, water is our electron donor. That's so beautiful. That's why your plants need water. Also, if they don't have water, their turgor pressure drops and they become all saggy against gravity and then they just look sad. And it's like, how are they gonna photosynthesize if they have such little surface area because they're all folded up on themselves? Okay. How is water used during photosynthesis? You already know the answer to this question because I showed you in the previous diagram. How is water used during photosynthesis? Somebody. Electron. It's an electron donor. It donates the electrons necessary to ultimately reduce carbon. Okay? Like, I never knew. I never knew why I had to give my plant water. I just, I never watered it. I got myself a, um, a, a succulent, right? They don't need any water, or very little. Yeah, so water is the source of electrons, and so here's basically the reaction that happens when you split water. Take two water molecules, you split it into four hydrogen ions, four electrons, and a molecule of oxygen. You're like, this is so cool. Like, water, I know what it's doing. I know why it's a reactant of photosynthesis. It's, it's providing the electrons we need to reduce carbon. But what's a product of this reaction? Oxygen. oxygen. And you're like, I never knew why plants, you know, produced oxygen. And now I do. And it's so gratifying. It makes me feel warm inside. Have you ever put the lid on a candle? and then the, the flame goes out because it runs out of oxygen, you need oxygen to fuel a combustion reaction. What's kind of cool is if you put a plant inside of the, the candle, inside of the jar with the candle, and you put the lid on, the flame will keep going because the plant will generate oxygen if you put the right plant in quick enough to keep fueling that combustion reaction until the plant dies because there's, I mean, you can put soil in there and, and you know nutrients, but eventually the water in there will all you know, dry up and then the plant will die. But it'll keep the flame going for a while. It's kind of cool. And you can, you can see it producing oxygen. Sorry. Uh, what's that? Well, if you put it right on top of the flame. I mean, there's, yeah, the, the flame is just a small part of that candle. I mean, it's going to be chilling in the wax and the wax is hot. That's probably going to kill the plant too. But you can put it inside of a big container, you know, with a big plant. And then, then you're okay. Yeah then you're okay. Water also provides the hydrogen ions for ATP synthesis. And so in, in cellular respiration during oxidative phosphorylation, what fueled the formation of ATP? So in oxidative phosphorylation, what directly fueled the synthesis of ATP? So that indirectly, right, providing electrons to move down. But what directly provided for the synthesis of ATP was the movement of hydrogen ions down their concentration gradient, right? We talked about, we talked about this in oxidative phosphorylation. I know it's been forever. I've, I, for, I even forgot. I'm just trying to make you feel better. I didn't forget, and you shouldn't have either. But we, 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 as those electrons move down to lower energy levels, they fuel pumping hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient, right? Into that inner membrane space. And then we create this massive gradient, enormous potential energy. And those hydrogen ions want to go flying down their concentration gradient. There's only one place for them to do that, and that's through a molecular machine called ATP synthase. And the kinetic energy from those hydrogen ions are used to fuel attaching phosphate to ADP to make ATP, right? You remember that? You remember it. Yeah, it's there somewhere. Maybe there. The same thing happens during photosynthesis. We pump hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient, creating a, a, an incredibly steep gradient. Hydrogen ions go flying down. The only way they can fly down is through a molecular machine called ATP synthase. And the kinetic energy from those hydrogen ions are used to attach phosphate onto ADP to make ATP. It's, it's so beautiful, but we need a source of hydrogen ions but well, the beauty of it is water provides the electrons we need to reduce carbon, but it also provides the hydrogen ions we need to make ATP. It gives everything. Brings everything to the party except the sunlight. The sunlight, you know, it brings the energy. Water doesn't bring the energy. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, like, why does it have to have both 
like if it can do cellular respiration and photosynthesis. There's mean? nothing to respirate if it doesn't make sugar. Okay. Right? We only do cellular respiration because we don't make our own sugar, right? We get our sugar from other organisms, right? Plants or better yet, animals, right? We, we get our, you're like, what sugar do we get from animals? We don't really need sugar. We can just take protein and put that in as, you know, acetyl-CoA and just do the Krebs cycle. Who needs glycolysis, right? Just eat meat. It's not a great idea. You take a multivitamin if you're going to only eat meat. Um, yeah, so plants, they're making their own sugar through photosynthesis, but then the only way they can fuel their processes is for cellular respiration because the entire plant isn't photosynthetic, Yeah. right? So there are parts of the plant that need... So the parts that are photosynthetic, they're making ATP. They can, they can use that ATP and not have to break down the sugar, but there are other parts of the plant that aren't photosynthetic, like you know, cells in the roots, cells in the stem, you know, that aren't photosynthetic and they need to be able to break down that sugar and, and, and produce okay. ATP. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Allison. So I guess related to that, the previous diagram showed that ATP is used to make the sugar molecules and carbon dioxide, so that ATP is not used in cellular respiration. It, it, it can be, oh, okay. but for simplicity's sake, we will say no, it is not. For simplicity's sake, we'll just say all the ATP made in the light dependent portions are used in the light in independent. That's for simplicity's sake. In reality, it's I mean ATP is ATP, right? If you make ATP, you can use it to do whatever you want. You can use it to fuel turning carbon into sugar or reducing carbon, um, or you can use it to fuel some other process that requires ATP, pumping something against its concentration gradient, um, walking something along, you know, a microtubules. You know, you can use that ATP for whatever you want. And I say you as though you're a plant, but the plants can use it for whatever, whatever they want. All right. Lastly, uh, water provides the oxygen necessary for aerobic respiration. Plants go through aerobic respiration and they use oxygen that they make. And we go through aerobic respiration and we need oxygen and we can't make it. But plants can. Plants can and they do. And so do other photosynthetic organisms, by the way, not just plants. Because you're like, Dr. Engel, well, what about the photosynthetic algae, right? Like the kind Moana put on that barnacle to trick, what's, what's the, tom, tom, tomateo? Yeah. Tomatoa, thank you. <laughs> Tomatoa. Yeah, my, my wife thinks that's the worst character she's ever seen in any movie. She, she, she openly weeps when that part of the movie comes on. She fears him, like the clown from It. But I think he's worse. All right, sorry, that's that, neither here nor there. All right, so here's, um, here's water. So here's basically both reactants of photosynthesis. We've got our water, and as it's split, it's providing the oxygen uh, necessary to make you know, uh, molecular oxygen, and the hydrogens are going to both sugar and to make you know, a little bit of water at the end of the reaction, and then carbon dioxide the oxygen from there is going both towards the sugar and making a little bit of water at the end. And then all of the carbon from there is going towards making sugars, okay? Or complex organic molecules. Really, sugars come later. All right, any questions? Okay, so at this point, you know the reaction for the overall process of photosynthesis, and you know the reaction for carbon Right, the reduction of carbon, I showed you that reaction. And you know the reaction for the splitting of water. And so what I want you to do is this. I want you to, not using the notes, just using the people around you, I want you to put those reactions into the context of is it light dependent or is it light independent, okay? So the splitting of water, does that happen in the light independent portion or light dependent? And then the reduction of carbon, is that light independent or is that light dependent? Okay? Make sense what I want you to do? You've got two basic half reactions. You have the overall reaction, carbon dioxide and water producing sugar and oxygen. And then we split those into two half reactions, water becoming sugar and, or uh, water actually becoming hydrogen ions, oxygen, and electrons, right? And then carbon dioxide becoming CH2O, right? Well, carbon dioxide and some hydrogen ions becoming CH2O. 
Okay, so you've got two half reactions. What I want you to do is place those as either light dependent or light independent. Okay, is light required to take water, split it to form hydrogen ions, electrons, and oxygen gas? Okay, does this make sense? Take about 90 seconds, work on this with those around you, and then we'll talk about this uh, together. 90 seconds, starting now. Hi everyone, I'm back. So, let's do this. A half reaction at a time. Half reaction at a time. And really, you have everything you need in order to be able to answer this. You may not know it, but, but it's, it all comes from that diagram that I showed you where on the left side, we had the light dependent parts and, and, and water was a reactant and oxygen was our product, right? And then on the right side of that diagram, carbon dioxide was our reactant and sugar or the CH2O, a carbohydrate, was our product. And so that tells us what? That the splitting of water is light dependent, okay? That the splitting of water is light dependent. That should make sense to you because we form water and cellular respiration as like our, 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 our byproduct, right? As electrons, we're able to get to basically the lowest energy level they, they had an opportunity for. And so we're like, wow, if we're going to split those electrons, that's going to re require some serious energy. And that's the beauty because there's serious energy in sunlight. Serious energy. But you all know this because you've been sunburned at some point in your life, right? If you've never been sunburned, count yourself just blessed. <laughs> because some of us are cursed with fair skin. And five minutes in the sun is enough to turn us into a lobster. So appreciate what you have. Because you won't always have it. Okay. All right. Let's see. Oh, yeah. And then the carbon dioxide, that's not light dependent. It's, it's electron dependent. If we're going to reduce carbon dioxide, we need electrons. But it, it's not light dependent. In fact, carbon dioxide, it would, it would love to be reduced. I mean, carbon would love to be reduced. It would love an opportunity to spend a little bit more time with electrons. Who wouldn't, right? And so carbon would love that. It's, it's electron dependent, and it is energy dependent. You still, it still requires energy, um, but, but it is, it's not light dependent. That, that's the light independent parts of, of photosynthesis. Make sense? Okay, cool. Our next question, where does photosynthesis take place? Where does photosynthesis take place? Well, it depends. The answer to this question is, well, Dr. Engel, really it depends on in which organism you're talking about. And so, I mean, wouldn't it be fun if on the, on the exam you had a short answer question that just said exactly this, where does photosynthesis take place? I mean, wouldn't that be fun? Because you could answer it, well, Dr. Engel, it depends 
on on which organism you're talking about. That's already one of the three sentences you need. And so in cyanobacteria, uh, these are photosynthetic bacteria. As you can probably imagine, since they're bacteria, they have very simple cellular structures. And so photosynthesis takes place in the plasma membrane. The, the molecular machinery necessary to harness sunlight and split water, it's in the plasma membrane. And then some of the other reactions just take place in, in the cytosol, in the fluid of the cell. Cyanobacteria, they, they are prokaryotes. They have very simple cellular structure. So there, there really aren't a lot of options of where you're going to package this machinery. Now, in eukaryotes, photosynthesis always takes place inside of the chloroplast. Okay, in eukaryotes, photosynthesis always takes place inside of the chloroplast. And what's interesting here is chloroplasts are a triple membrane structure. Like mitochondria, they have two membranes. The mitochondria have the outer membrane and the inner membrane. Chloroplasts have the outer membrane and the inner membrane. But in addition, chloroplasts have an inner stack, they have an inner complex made of what look like stacks of membranes called the grana. And it's a, it's a third membrane layer. So that third membrane layer, this, the membranes are called thylakoid membranes. The stacks of those membranes are called grana. But I'll show you this in a moment. And that's where the molecular machinery necessary to harness sunlight and split water, that's where it's at. It's inside the deepest parts of the chloroplast in these thylakoid membranes. The light independent reactions still take place in the chloroplast, but they take place in the fluid of the chloroplast called the stroma. And you're like, okay, so we've got cyanobacteria, the molecular machinery in the plasma membrane. The rest of the reactions take place in the liquid of the cell. The innermost part of the chloroplast, we've got basically membrane folded up, packed full of this machinery and fluid. And you're like, that's so cool. It's, they're, they're, they're analogous. Uh, but some would argue that in addition to being analogous, that is serving a similar function, that they are also homologous, that is having a similar ancestry. And that is that chloroplast originated as eukaryotic cells phagocytized cyanobacteria and allowed them to live. Allowed them to live and harness sunlight as energy for the eukaryote. You're like, it's such a wonderful story. There's several problems. One is it's inconsistent with the biblical description of origins, right? Big problem. But two, it's like, man, what mechanism do we have by which a eukaryotic cell phagocytizes something? It's like, I don't want to eat this. I want to enslave it. I mean, I can do that, right? That's what I do with my dog. Like, I don't want to eat him. I enslave him, right? Like, I can do that. I really don't. He doesn't do anything for me. I don't enslave him. I mean, he plays fetch with me, but that's really it. And he'll go on a walk. But he's, I mean, he only weighs 19 pounds. I mean, what's he going to do? Like, pull a sled? We're going to go in there. I did a rod with my 19-pound poodle mix. Man, I'd kill it. Is that what it, see, I did a rod, right? The dog race? Yeah. Anyways, sorry. That has nothing to do with cell biology. But it's like, man, that's, that's a really cool, that's really cool to know, man, I could use this. I shouldn't need it. I think I could use this and enslave it. And then every time I replicate, ensure I replicate that as well so that all of my offspring get it as well. It's, it's interesting. It's convenient. All right. So here's uh, the structure of a chloroplast. Here are the two membranes, outer membrane, inner membrane, just like mitochondria. Additionally, they've got these folds of membranes, the folds of thylakoid membranes in the middle. Then these stacks of them are called grana. Singular is granum, plural grana. And it's like, there's a ton of surface area. Do you see all the surface area? That's a lot of membrane. And you're like, why is there so much membrane? Because the machinery to harness sunlight and split water, where is it? It's in that membrane. You need a lot of it. And you're like, wow, they're just, they're really, really devoting a lot of energy and development into harnessing sunlight. And you're like, thank goodness they are, because otherwise light would, life wouldn't work. 
and I wouldn't have whatever delicious plant product you like to eat. Or really, you wouldn't have what delicious animal you like to eat that eats plant products, right? I really don't care about plant products. I could live my life and never eat broccoli again. I could do it. And I probably wouldn't be significantly impacted in any way, other than I probably wouldn't experience the gas that comes along with eating broccoli. But you know what? I could not live my life not eating pigs again. And you're like, but Dr. Engel, pigs, they're omnivorous. They'll eat whatever you give them. That's true. But if you're going to feed meat to a pig, whatever the pigs are eating, they had to eat plants, you know? Ultimately, you have to get to plants somewhere. Man, I'm getting off topic. Telling inappropriate jokes and getting off topic. I don't know what happened. Okay, fourth question. Uh, how does the entire plant function in photosynthesis? How does the entire plant function in photosynthesis? You're like, Dr. Engel, you just told us photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast. It's not the entire plant. That's one organelle in, in, in a cell. That's true, but what are reactants of photosynthesis? And remember, what are the reactants for that reaction that never really happens, but is like a summary of what's going on? Water and carbon dioxide. We got to get water and carbon dioxide to the cells involved in photosynthesis, right? I mean, we don't, the plants do. And so here, here you go. So you have structures on the stems and the leaves of plants called stomata that are openings. And these stomata open to allow carbon dioxide to diffuse into the plant. We're providing the carbon dioxide for the plants to provide us the oxygen. It's a wonderful relationship. Have you ever noticed, or have you ever heard that when you talk to your plants, they grow better? Have you heard that before? And then, what do you, if you're sitting there talking to plants, what are you giving plants a lot of? Carbon dioxide. And you're like, oh my gosh, the plants, they don't really, they don't really know what's going on. I'm fueling them with carbon dioxide necessary for them to carry out photosynthesis. But I mean, if you want to talk to your plants, do it. I mean, they're not going to talk back. It's wonderful. <laughs> uh, so water and uh, oxygen that are made during photosynthesis will also exit uh, through the stomata. But then the water used to fuel photosynthesis, that needs to be absorbed by the roots. If it's a vascular plant, I know you're going to say, Dr. Engel, not all plants are vascular plants. Not all plants have roots. You're like, what about mosses and liverworts, right? They don't have roots. You're right. And so they, they absorb water. A lot of their tissues absorb water. You're absolutely right. But for most plants, by number of species, we've got to absorb the water necessary for photosynthesis in the roots. And we've got to absorb minerals necessary for just carrying out other metabolic processes. We've got to absorb them in the roots. And then the sugars made during photosynthesis have to be distributed all throughout the plant so that every cell in the plant has a food supply. Because not every cell in the plant can go through photosynthesis. So the plants actually have to transport the sugars that they make around the plant tissues. And this is why you get things that are really large plants like trees where you can tap into this sugar source, right? Like you can, what, do they call it milking? I think they call it milking, like a sugar maple. I think the process is called milking the, the sugar maple, but that sounds weird. It's not milk. You're not milking it. Anyways, but if, if you, if you, can, you can tap into that sugar supply. Is that sugar is being transported around that massive sugar maple. The trees are photosynthesizing, generating a lot of sugar, and then that sugar is moving through tissues to fuel cells in the bark, to fuel cells in the roots all over the body, you can tap into that and you can use it to make maple sugar. It takes 50 gallons of it, by the way, to make one gallon of maple, maple syrup. Worth it? Yeah, definitely worth it. Yeah. So um, for like uh, gynosperms and stuff like yes. that? Yes, gymnosperms. Yeah, gymnosperms. Yep. Uh, do the photosynthesis take place? In like the needles. In the needles? Yep. <laughs> yep. The needles are modified leaves. Oh, wow. Yep. Okay, so here's a, here's a typical cr I mean, cross-section of a leaf. So here's a leaf, and uh, we've got several cells that are basically lining the outer edge of the leaf. Not actually forming the lining, but are lining them. 
and and these these cells um, are are packed full of chloroplasts, and you can tell that because they're green and chloroplasts have a green pigment that make the chloroplast green, and so these cells are green, right? Packing these leaves. And then within these leaves, we've got these openings, these stomata that allow carbon dioxide to diffuse through. And then we have all these cells that are packed full of chloroplasts, and every one of their chloroplasts packed full of these thylakoid membranes, and every one of those thylakoid membranes packed with the machinery necessary to harness sunlight and split water. And you're like, that's so cool. Like, so these are the only photosynthetic cells, but the whole plant is involved in this process of photosynthesis, getting the carbon dioxide necessary for it, getting the water necessary for it, and then getting rid of excess oxygen. Because if plants actually store up excess oxygen, bad things happen, but we'll talk about that on Wednesday. You're like, but Dr. Engel, you said the plants need oxygen in order to go through aerobic respiration. They do, but they can't build up too much. Just like you need oxygen to carry out aerobic respiration, but you don't want to build up too much either. But that's another story for another time, even another class. We won't talk about what happens if you become over-oxygenated. Okay, any questions about this, how the whole plant is, is involved in photosynthesis? Y'all are loving it? You're like, now this afternoon when I'm eating my flavorless plants, I'll appreciate them because, you know, I know when it's coming. Or this evening when I'm eating meat, I'll appreciate the plants that were necessary to grow my pig. Yeah, Allison. So in plants that aren't green, is it? Yeah, different pigment. Yeah, different pigment. Because, yeah, plants are photos. Now, some plants rely on photosynthesis less than others, right? So some plants, uh, the bulk of their organic material doesn't come from photosynthesis, photosynthesis making their own. They actually, they, they're carnivorous as well. Like you've got the Venus flytrap, corpse flowers. Um, you've got, you know, several plants that the, the, the bulk of their organic material is coming from eating other organisms. Um, but that's unusual. But even in them, they're, they're still photosynthetic. And then you have some plants that rely entirely on photosynthesis, but they're not green. And it's, they have different pigments in addition to the green. And so when you combine them with it, it gives you some unusual colors, reds and purples and you know, cool things. Now the flowers, the flowers are typically not photosynthetic. They're not, they're not, they don't exist to increase photosynthesis. They exist to tra to um, attract pollinators. Is that the same thing with the fruit then? Yeah, fruit, yeah. So, well, not to attract pollinators. The fruit's to attract dispersers, animals that will disperse the seed to somewhere else so that the offspring don't compete with the adults. Okay, but yes, yeah. they're not photosynthetic either. Yeah. Emily. Okay. Awesome. You're welcome. No questions on this first four questions? I've got more. We're not done. Don't you worry. You're like, Dr. Ingle, you can't be done. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> okay. So next four questions. Uh, we will not get through all of these four questions in the uh, remaining time we have, but we're, we're going to try. Uh, what are the two processes of the light-dependent reactions? So the reactions that harness the energy from sunlight to split water, okay? What are the two processes there? Uh, how does light provide energy? Uh, how does the plant harvest light energy? Uh, and then how do electrons flow through the photosystems? How do electrons flow through the photosystems? Okay. Let's, let's keep going. So what are the two processes of the light-dependent reactions? So in order for light energy to be harvested uh, and converted into chemical energy, we have to accomplish two things. We have to accomplish two things. One, we have to absorb the light. So that's one process. We, we need to absorb the light. And this is something we can do. I can absorb light. You can absorb light. Right? It happens all the time happens to help us generate vitamin D. It also happens to help us, you know, increase pigmentation so we don't burn as badly the next time. So plants have particular pigments inside of the chloroplasts that absorb very specific wavelengths of light. Very specific wavelengths of light. 
You know this uh, from a physical science class you, you probably took 10 years ago, but you know that the color of something is the results of whatever light it doesn't absorb and reflects back, right? So if something is blue, it's absorbing all light from the visible spectrum except the blue light, and it's reflecting that back, and that's why when you see it, you see blue, because blue light's being reflected back. And so if plants are typically green, they're absorbing all frequencies of light except green light, and that's being reflected back. So these pigments that these plants have in their chloroplasts are absorbing all of the parts of the visible spectrum except the green part. And now you're like, man, I, I could envision a pretty sweet experiment I could do using this. I'm gonna, we're gonna do it in a lab. You're gonna like this. We're gonna filter out all light but green light and see how well plants photosynthesize. Hopefully if somebody remembered to get my spinach. If any of you are going to lunch after this, grab some spinach just, and, and you're coming to lab this afternoon, grab some spinach and bring it just in case the person I asked to bring spinach doesn't bring it. You just stick it in your pocket. <laughs> Tell them I said it's okay. Tell them actually if they need to bill somebody to bill the, the, the biology department. If they're like, no, you can't take spinach out of the cafeteria. Like, just bill the, bill the science department. Okay. So these pigments are located in, in, in photosystems, these molecular machines that are inside of the thylakoid membrane. So that's one process, light absorption. We can do this, plants do this, okay? Plants do it in other tissues as well, but when they absorb it in these photosystems, the light-dependent reactions take place. Something we cannot do that photosynthetic organisms can do is synthesize NADPH and ATP. So this is the second process of the light-dependent reactions. First process, light absorption in the photosystems. Second process, the synthesis of NADPH and ATP. This is what we cannot do because we are not photo-autotrophic, unfortunately. Because that'd be pretty cool if you could go out into the sun and synthesize sugar. Then it's like running a marathon would be like no problem. You wouldn't need to carbo load before the marathon. Just as you're running, you're making more sugar. And then since you're not, yeah, sorry, never mind. All right. So electrons from water are passed to our electron carrier NADP plus. Hydrogen from water is also passed to NADP plus, but before that, it's forced against its concentration gradient. And then these hydrogen ions want to move down their concentration gradient, and then they do so by a process called chemiosmosis, which is the same process we saw in cellular respiration. And when they do, they move through ATP synthase, and they generate ATP. Okay? Does that make sense? Bless you. You're welcome. All right. No questions? Oh, this is just, this is still big picture. Don't worry, we'll get more detailed. You're like, Dr. Engel, okay, I, I get this. I, I understand the big picture, but I, I want some of the details. I want to know what these photosystems look like. I want to know how they work. I want to know how we strip electrons, where those electrons go, where they shuttle to. That'll all come. That'll all come. You just, just be patient. So how does light provide energy? How does light provide energy? That's a wonderful question. You're like, when I step outside, why does it feel so warm? Right? So you notice a 60 degree day feels completely different if it's 60 degrees and cloudy versus 60 degrees and sunny. But it's still 60 degrees. But it's because you're also absorbing energy from the light that you're getting a lot more of if it's not cloudy. And so light is a, is a form of energy called radiant energy or radiation. And so light is a complex entity that travels in waves, very clearly travels in waves, and yet it behaves like a particle. It travels in waves, kind of like, kind of like sound waves, but different, and yet it behaves like a particle, that if light hits something, it actually, it, it, passes, it passes its energy similar to the way a particle being shot into something does. So we have what's called the electromagnetic spectrum, and this represents all light. 
not just the visible light, but all light. I don't know if you knew this or not, but we can only see a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Do you know that microwaves are light? And so when you're cooking using a microwave, you're cooking something using light. It's so cool. You also use, and then radio waves that, you know, hit your car and then are, you know, converted into a sound or hit your cell phone and are converted into a sound. Those are light. It's all, it's all light. So light travels is what's called a transverse wave, which means as light is moving this way, so it's displacing the medium this way, or as light is traveling this way, it's displacing the medium that way, okay? It's a, it's a transverse wave. So light, if a wave of light is moving this way, it really moves like this, and the light is actually displacing the medium perpendicular to the direction it's moving. And you're like, well, that's cool, but what does that actually mean? Well, what it allows us to do is we can measure the distances between what we call uh, crests. And so if we're looking at a wave and light is traveling like this, it gets to a point where it's at its highest, that's called the crest, and then it gets to a point where it's at its lowest, that's called the trough, right? Crest and trough and crest and trough. And then we can measure the distance between two crests or the distance between two troughs and, and that's, that's what we call a wavelength. And you're like, well, that's cool, but what does that actually mean? Well, it gives us a way to quantify a particular form of light. It gives us an ability to quantify a particular piece of light that we call a photon. And so this wavelength can be anywhere from 10 to the minus 6 nanometers. And a nanometer is tiny. Like one nanometer is smaller than what you can see in a microscope. But this is 10 to the minus 6 nanometers, meaning 1, 1, what would that be, 1, 1 millionth? Yeah, 1, 1 millionth of a nanometer. And a nanometer is already too small to see under a light microscope. And then it goes all the way up to 10 to the 3 kilo, kilo, kilometers or kilometers. And you're like, well, that's not that impressive. A kilometer is not even a mile. But 10 to the 3 of them, that's 1,000 kilometers in a single wavelength of light. So it's a huge amount of variation. So the energy, the amount of energy in a piece of light called a photon is inversely proportional to the wavelength. It's basically, it's a fancy way of saying as wavelength increases, energy decreases. The, the larger the wavelength of light, the lower the energy in that photon of light. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. You know, like, that makes sense. If all light is traveling at the same rate, right, the speed of light, so every, every photon of light is traveling at the same rate, the number of times it makes a wave in that same distance should require more energy, right? If it's moving at the same velocity. And so here's the electromagnetic spectrum going everywhere. Oh, this is just visible light amplified down here, but going everywhere from 10 to the minus 6 nanometers in wavelength, all the way up to 10 to the, thir 10 to the third kilometers in wavelength. And then the visible portion of the spectrum is only from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. So just a very, very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is all we can see. And okay, so plants are predominantly what color? Green, which means that they're absorbing every part of the visible spectrum except the green part. So they're absorbing all of this, and they're absorbing all of this. So under what color light should plants perform best? Blue and red, right? Or white if you can give it the whole, you know, spectrum. But under blue and red, and they're going to perform very poorly when given green light. And you'll see that in lab today. It'll be fun. I've got some green napkins, and you'll wrap some beakers and green napkin, and you're like, I'm going to filter out everything but the green light. But then you're going to be thinking, but Dr. Ingle, is it because I'm wrapping a napkin around it, or is it really because it's green? So to control for that, you'll wrap a white napkin around. Oh, I didn't bring my white napkins. Oh. No, we're, 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 no, we're not going to, oh, we're not canceling it. Yeah, but they're different. So what we'll have to do is the Thursday group, you'll provide our control for all of the lab sections. So you won't be able to write your, finish writing your write-up until 
I give you the data from Thursday. I'll remember the white napkins for Thursday. But they're not the same though, because that's as my green as my green. I do I do appreciate that though. I want to make sure it's the same material, same company, same everything, just a different color. Okay. All right. Well, we're out of time, but yeah. What's is there a whole spectrum of colors that we can't see? Oh yes. That are above, that are above, or above the ocean? Yes. What? 